Good morning. It's a pleasure to be back with you again. I don't know when the last time was. I've been here quite a few times, but <laughs> time flies. Or like, um, who is it? Kermit the Frog's, Frog says, time's fun when you're having flies. Um, I bring you greetings from Summit Christian College up in Scotts Bluff, well, I guess Gearing, Nebraska, technically. Um, used to be Platte Valley Bible College, started in 1951, and uh, I think North Christian Church here has been supporting the college for a long time, and we just want to say thank you and give a kind of a real brief update on how things are going. Uh, I suppose our big news is that we're pursuing accreditation and are getting closer and closer to being fully accredited. We re reached a milestone this last year, and for the first time, our students were able to receive Pell Grants for their costs of their classes in the first semester. Um, the trustees and all of us, faculty and administration, have agreed that we do not want to uh, become eligible, or well, I guess we're eligible, but we're not filling out the paperwork so students can get student loans, because we want them to be able to graduate debt-free. That's one of the goals. We try to keep our tuition low enough that when students graduate, they can graduate debt-free. We know of a lot of places where a student will graduate with $50,000 of student debt, well, it's a little hard to go in to take a ministry in a church, <laughs> you know, in some small Wyoming town. They're not going to pay you enough to pay off a $50,000 student loan very easily. And so we'd like to keep our students' options open so they could go to the mission field or whatever, you know, uh, without having to be burdened down by paying back student loans. So. We are offering Pell Grants, but we're not offering student loans. Um, so we're, we're almost to the end of the whole accreditation process. We got two areas that we probably really need to work on. One is student enrollment. Our enrollment this semester, I think, is about 40, which is not enough for us to be able to do everything that we really want to do. So we're working on that. And the second problem is not unrelated to the first problem, and that is finances. <laughs> if you have a diminished number of students, you have a diminished amount of income coming from student, you know, paying tuitions and stuff like that. So we, we have a plan that's in place to try to increase our tuition or not our tuition, increase our uh, federal, increase our financial base and everything like that. I suppose for years, ever, as long as I've been with the college, I came there in 1977, uh, the college has to a certain extent operated by faith. It seems natural for a faith organization to do it that way, but uh, that doesn't work very good for the bookkeepers, you know. They, they don't have any button on their calculator that is the faith button, you know, where how do you know you're going to get the, the funds you need? And you say, well, God has always provided for us. We just believe that he will. And he does, and he has. But the, you know, the financial gurus want us to have a fed, uh, have funds in reserve so that we have enough in reserve that we can guarantee that faculty will get paid and things like that. So if you want to pray for us, pray for more students and pray for us to be able to strengthen our finances in the, you know, in the months to come so that we can move ahead. Um, the, this is kind of a leftover uh, visit from Love Month. Traditionally, February is Love Month for the Summit Christian College, and they send us faculty out to various places, to churches, to ask for a special offering and to say thank you for the support that you're giving. And um, I think this one was supposed to be back in February, but we couldn't work it out on the calendar, so here it is. I, I thought if I was doing it real... Um, 
you know, keeping it in tune with what's going on in everybody's lives today, I would have a sermon on uh, income tax day or something like that, which is coming up in five days or whatever. But I don't have a sermon like that, so <laughs> you'll have to settle for a sermon on love. Now you think, okay, love, how many times have I heard sermons on love? What could possibly be said new and different about that? Well, probably not anything. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to say anything new or different, but it might be a reminder for you. And in terms of importance, I'm not sure there is anything more important in terms of the Christian ethic or the Christian virtues that's more important than love. 1 Corinthians 13, the last few verses of that says, now there are three things that remain, faith and hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. And so I think everybody acknowledges in the list of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, you know, and lots of the other ones put on love, which binds everything together in Christian unity. So you have many statements that elevate love to the highest position in terms of how we should treat each other and how we should live. The word love is used, well, the Greek words for love are used about 250 times in the New Testament, all combined. And so, you know, you can make a pretty strong argument that love is a very necessary thing for us to talk about every once in a while. And as I said, you probably have heard a ton of sermons on it. One of the real issues that we face with love is that like a couple of other Bible words that are used in modern American English, you always wonder if the definition of the word as it's found in the Bible is the same as our contemporary understanding of the word. And I think that really is the case with love. That love is a very broad, varied word in the English language as it's used today, but that's not always exactly what it means when you go back to the scriptures. We need to narrow our definition. So when I was looking stuff up to, you know, explain this, I thought, you know, where do you go if you want to get a definition for a word? Well, if you're my generation, you'd say you go to a dictionary. But if you're moving into the modern age, you Google it. And you end up looking at Wikipedia for a definition of love, right? Well, that's what I did, just so I could be, appear to be contemporary. <laughs> Love is a variety of different feelings, states, and attitudes that ranges from interpersonal affection, I love my mother, to pleasure, I love that stake. It can refer to an emotion of a strong attraction and personal attachment. That's what Wikipedia says. Of course, Wikipedia has no official status, I guess. They always say to challenge anything that Wikipedia says. So if you want to get a more of an official definition, then you go to Merriam-Webster's website. You know, since they publish dictionaries, that ought to be good. And they have a big, long, you know, set of definitions. But the first one says, a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties, a maternal love for a child, or attraction based on sexual desire, the affection and tenderness felt by lovers. When you think about it, that may be one of the most frequent ways that the word love is used. And in some idioms, that's kind of all that it means. You know, you talk about make love or to fall in love or to be in love or anything like that. Many, many cases that's talking about some kind of physical, romantic, or sexual attraction that two people face. Now that You may have a little more difficulty when you go to take that understanding of love and then transfer it over to biblical passages that talk about love. Um, if you go on down through all the definitions that they give and you get down to number four in the Webster, Merriam-Webster's definition, it says unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another as 
the fatherly concern of God for humankind. So that would probably be a definition that would work pretty well. That comes in number four <laughs> on the list of definitions that Merriam-Webster gives. Uh, a really interesting definition, though, is one I found in the Urban Dictionary. I don't think I'd ever looked at the Urban Dictionary, but apparently it you know, kind of gives you a contemporary definition of words as it's used around today, and I, I think that might be true, but this is, this is really interesting. It says, love, the most spectacular, indescribable, deep euphoric feeling for someone. Love is an incredibly powerful word. When you're in love, you always want to be together. When you're not, you're thinking about being together because you need that person, and without them, your life is incomplete. This love is unconditional affection with no limits or conditions, completely loving someone. It's when you trust the other with your life and when you would do anything for each other. When you love someone, you want nothing more than for them to be truly happy no matter what it takes because that's how much you care about them because their needs come before your own. You hide nothing of yourself and you can tell the other person anything because you know they accept you just the way you are and vice versa. It's when they're the last thing you think about before you go to sleep and when they're the first thing you think of when you wake up. The feeling that warms your heart and leaves you overcome by a feeling of serenity. Love involves wanting to show your affection or devotion to each other. It's the smile on your face you get when you're thinking about them and miss them. Love can make you do anything and sacrifice for what will be better in the end. Love is intense and passionate. Everything seems brighter, happier, more wonderful when you're in love. If you find it, don't let it go. I really think that's probably hitting the nail right on the head the way most Americans and maybe English-speaking people throughout the world think of love in the modern context. How does that work when you sort of plug that definition of love into some of the biblical passages? In some ways, when you get right down to it, it sounds like what they're really defining is more of what it means to be in love. And being in love is a whole other set of ideas and concepts and things that work together than just the concept of love. J Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy. And do good to those who hurt you and who would persecute you. Now, how does that work with the Urban Dictionary definition of love? To have this warm, euphoric feeling for your enemies. You know, you think, I don't think so. It just doesn't work that way. And so what we end up with is, I think there are a lot of people who are sort of frustrated or confused about what God wants them to do. They, they want to be obedient to God. They want to love people the way that God tells them to, but they can't force themselves to generate that kind of warm, euphoric feeling for somebody. It just ain't happening, you know? And, and, and so they don't know what to do. That is God really commanding us to have this, this certain feeling for people? And how can you make yourself have a feeling that you don't have? I, I, it's kind of like, I'm not a big fan of green vegetables. You know, there are certain vegetables that I don't really like very much. I, I'm trying to kind of revisit each one because I've discovered in last couple of years that there were things that I thought I didn't like that I actually do like. In 1967, when I was going through college, I took a piece of pie down off of the rack, you know, it was nice and red and juicy looking, and I thought it was cherry pie. Took a big bite of it, and it was, whoa, what is this? It was rhubarb. 
Rhubarb is not cherry pie. And so I drew the conclusion, being the logical person that I am, that I did not like rhubarb. And so from 1967 until a couple of years ago, I, whenever anybody offered me rhubarb, I said, oh, sorry, I don't like rhubarb. And then my wife made a, a rhubarb cake or rhubarb bread or something like that and put cinnamon and stuff like that in with it, and it smelled really good. And just I just thought I would nibble on it and see if I liked it, and I thought it tasted really good. And I said, well, this doesn't really taste like rhubarb at all. And she says, well, it sort of does. And so then a while later, she made a rhubarb betty, which is kind of like a pie without a crust or something like that. And I had some of that, and it was really good. And I said, I still don't think it tastes like rhubarb. And she says, this is fully rhubarb. If you like this, you like rhubarb. And so I thought... All those years I've been wrong, <laughs> that I thought I didn't like rhubarb. And she said, sometimes people ba make rhubarb pie and they don't sweeten it enough and it's really tart, you know, and, and especially if you were expecting cherry pie and then it's rhubarb, it's not quite the same. And so I th started going back and trying some green vegetables that I thought that I didn't like and thought maybe if I tried them again that I might like them. And guess what? It, it, it ain't happening. <laughs> you know, you're taking asparagus spear, and I, I suppose they're good for you and all that kind of stuff, but I, it just isn't there, you know. I just don't like it, and I don't know that... The only way I, you could make an asparagus, you know, that you could get me to like asparagus is if you could make it not taste like asparagus, because I just don't like the taste of it. When I, when I was a kid, my mom served as spinach. I remember in second grade, this vision is clear in my mind from second grade. And she said, you're not leaving the table until you eat your spinach. And she didn't give me very much. And I remember that I put it in my mouth, but I could not chew it and swallow it. It was just horrible tasting. And so I sat there at the dinner table from then until bedtime. And I'm glad that she didn't save it for breakfast and make me eat it. I, I don't know how long I could have gone before I ate it, but my mom loved me and she wasn't that cruel. But I, I could not bring myself to eat spinach. So, and for some people, I think that's the way it is with love. If you're telling them that they have to come somehow generate this feeling for people... It's about like me liking asparagus. I just don't like it. But is that what God really wants? Well, let's look at some New Testament passages. And some, you know, you will remember very clearly. But what I want us to do is to look at the context and the framework in which the word love is used and see what's associated with it. And if anything in the associations with this word can help us to understand what it's like or, or what it might mean. So John 3.16, one that you probably all know, For God so loved the world that he had a warm euphoric feeling for all the people on the earth. <laughs> Wait, that's not what it says, is it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That God's love was ultimately demonstrated in something that he did. And I found that to be very consistent as I was studying for this. You know, like I say, all the different words for love are used, or the, the two main words. A noun and a verb are used 250 times in the New Testament. And I was looking at, the, the, well, about 40 times it refers to God's love for mankind, and about 40 times refers to man's love for God, and about 125 times it's in reference to our love for each other. Um, and of the ones where God's love for us, I was surprised, really, at how many times that the scripture says something like God demonstrates his own love for us in this, 
that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It seems like the scriptures give as the evidence or the proof or the demonstration of God's love that he gave his, that Jesus Christ died for us. That was the way that God showed us that he loved us was to send his son to die for us. Um, another passage you're probably very familiar with, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 7. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have faith so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love is seen in what love does. That in all, you know, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. The way that love is described is described in the way that it treats other people. Matthew 5, 43 and 44, I already mentioned to you, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you and Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. I'd left, left that out. Oh, that's New King James. Okay. Um, John 14, 15 is another interesting one. Um, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is one area that I sometimes struggle with a little bit. How do you express your love to God? Or what is love for God feel like. And the modern worship institution, you know, or the worship business, in a way, is trying to get people to understand it in such a way that if you come together and your song service works right, and you have this wonderful worship experience, that that is loving God. And I think... Show me one passage of scripture that says anything like that. I mean, I, I like a good song service as well as the next guy. You guys did great today. I enjoyed it. But I, I don't know that that really means that I love God. This is what the scripture says. If you love me, keep my commandments. I think if God looks down on us and he sees us, you know, raising our hands in worship and all of this kind of thing, that's all fine. That's a sacrifice of praise that we offer up to God, but I'm not sure he's going to, that that's going to satisfy him that you prove that you really love him, especially if you turn around and walk out these doors and you don't do what he tells you to. If you love me, keep my commandments. Romans chapter 5, 8. God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. Any other commandment summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is a really deep, I think, important concept that if mankind somehow would love each other sort of intuitively or consistently, apparently God is saying you could virtually do away with the law because love does no wrong to a neighbor. So you would always do what was right to each other if you truly loved one another. And in some ways, probably the reverse is true. How do you know what it means to love one another? 
Well, you don't lie, you don't steal, you don't murder, you don't commit adultery, you know, all those kind of things that God prohibited those because they were not loving things to do. You might think about this proposal, see if you think it's really true. Excuse me, I got a hair in my mouth, that's bugging me. (laughs) There's no such thing as a loving act which violates a commandment of God. I think there are people that think something that they're doing, they did it out of love, when in reality, is breaking God's commandments. And I guess I would challenge their idea that they're acting out of love. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18 is a very important passage of Scripture on this subject. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. You see that consistent statement about God's love? By this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. You know, this, you can just see this. <laughs> you know, there's somebody who's really hungry or cold or something like that. You know, and being the good Christian fellow I am, I put my arm around the guy and I say, Oh, brother, you know, Jesus loves you and so do I. Have a good day. Now, leave me alone, please. <laughs> How is that an expression of the love of God? I think that's loving in word or in talk, but not in deed and in truth. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. You may have thought, I wonder where he's going to get to this one. (laughs) Because this is the greatest commandment. A lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what's written in the law? You're a lawyer. How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, which is the Shema Israel, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. That was, I mean, that was a good answer. And then he tacked on this other one, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. My students love it when I say that to them. (laughs) If I answer a question, or if I ask a question, they give me the answer, and I say, good answer, you know. Woo, they're, (laughs) because I guess I probably need to say that more often, that they're always afraid when I ask them a question that it's a trick, you know, and that they'll never be able to give the right answer. So then they don't say nothing. But Jesus said, you have answered correctly. But that wasn't all he said. He said, do this and you will live. Sometimes it's a lot easier to know the right answer than it is to do the right answer. And so this lawyer, wishing to justify himself, said, who is my neighbor? If you can narrow the field of people who are your neighbor down to a small enough number well, then you might be able to love your neighbor as yourself. But if the pool is too big, then that becomes a problem. You know, there's a saying, to live above with the saints we love, oh, and that will be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, that's a different story. Sometimes, the, you know, I think maybe that's the whole problem with my being able to actually love my neighbor as myself is that the pool is too big. There are too many people in that category that, you know, they're like asparagus spears. I just don't like them. (laughs) And so Jesus gave him an answer. Who is my neighbor? So he tells him a parable. That's 
That's the way Jesus liked to do things. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. How did the priest feel about the man who had fallen among thieves? Your answer to that question will probably tell me more about what kind of a person you are <laughs> than the priest, because we have no idea. But I think it's possible that he looked over at him and he said, oh, that poor man, look what happened to him. Oh, you know, and then he hurried away. <laughs> I mean, he may have felt sorry for him. He may have had pity for him. I mean, you could possibly argue that he had compassion for him, although I don't know that you could make that one stick. And then a Levite came down and passed by on the other side. A Samaritan, though, as he journeyed, came to where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. So which of these three, do you think, proved to be neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And the lawyer says, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. You see, I think ultimately what Jesus, the parable of the Good Samaritan, what it's intended to show is not, in a sense, who is my neighbor. What he really is telling that parable to show is, what does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? And it may be more about who can you be a neighbor to, because that's what it means to love your neighbor as yourself is that you go be a neighbor to them, to love them. But ultimately, it's not described in terms of how the Samaritan felt. It says that he had compassion, but then that emotion, if you want to call it that, or the feeling of compassion moved him to do something. And uh, I, we don't know it may have been that the priest and the Levite both had the feeling, but they had reasons or excuses or something, you know, to touch. They, they may not have known that the guy was still alive, and if they touched a dead body, then they would be unclean and would be unable to participate in the services at the temple and stuff like that. Or it may have been that they were just plain afraid that the fact that the one guy had fallen among thieves, the thieves might still be around, you know, looking for more victims. And so they just scurried off. I don't know why they didn't help. And maybe ultimately it doesn't matter. The fact is they didn't help. And to the extent or the fact that they did not help means they did not love their neighbor as themselves. And love is not limited by racial or ethnic or any other kind of boundaries like that because the Samaritan should have been the last person that would do something like that for a, a Jewish man, but he had compassion and he acted in the way that God commanded him to do. And when Jesus got all done with explaining this to the lawyer, look at what he said. He said, you go and do likewise. And I think that's just exactly what Jesus would say to us. It's one thing to know the right answer. It's another thing to go and do likewise. Thank you very much.